but just an idea. All of the samurai periods put together or any of the periods associated with anything samurai related is around 4% of the total recorded history we have in Japan. That's not including the Paleolithic. So it's only around 4%. And if you take out the periods where samurai were like bushi, but not a social class, it's only about 2%. So we're basing our perception of Japan on two to 4% of the recorded past, either material or written that we have for, yeah, this wide set of islands. So, yeah, yeah Jomo it, Great. Great jo demonstration. Jomo, <laughs> Jomo and Great. Also, I, I, you know, with the, the Jomo, and I think it's, um, it's a really interesting example of how a, you can take a very, very um, interesting sort of material culture phenomenon, particularly mm. their pottery, and turn it into something fantastical. And, and I think, uh, you know, perhaps the, the best example of this is Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah. I pointed this out to you, Steve, uh, in our chat. You were like... Oh. I lost it when Breath of the Wild came out. <laughs> yeah. Because I love Zelda games. And I've been studying the Jomon for quite some time. And so, yeah, for those who don't know, all of the, the Sheikah technology and aesthetic is all based around Jomon period pottery and mm -hmm. sort of uh, symbols and, I don't know, the general aesthetic. I was trying not to say aesthetic twice, <laughs> in a row, but I failed. Yeah, you, you take those, 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 <laughs> those middle Jomon pots and you whoop, put them upside down and those are the shrines. Uh, likewise, that same sort of like spirally aesthetic that they have on the pottery yeah. is seen on those those guardians, the stalker guardians, and everything. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it, it's a, it's an interesting way of basically bringing this part of Japan's like history and like prehistory, you could say, you know, mm -hmm. into the the public eye. Um, yeah, but it's also like a really interesting example of how. The Jomo, who, and I guess we'll talk about the connection between the Jomo and contemporary Japanese people, mm -hmm. or, or perceived connections or lack thereof, and how, you know, Japanese society and Japan as a country, via, you know, the spread of technology and games media, have basically almost like taken ownership of Jomo identity and Jomo traits. Uh, and I kind of want to leverage that or at least segue that into a discussion about like what it means to be Japanese yeah and I think that's something that we have to talk about before we even dive into more of the like oh these are some cool things that you can use in your D&D &D game or other TTRPG um, yeah. because like you said that two to four percent of the past is basically held up as the sort of signifier of what it means to be Japan pre, you know, the modernization of that country. Yeah. Um, so 1868. <laughs> yeah. With the, like the, the, the black sails and Matthew Perry and the Meiji restoration. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, like post world war two, Japan uh, mm -hmm. and Japanese nationalism. Um, but Emma, do you think that you could give like our audience sort of a, a an introduction to what we kind of mean by where we're talking about the the myth of homogeneity in japan in contemporary japan sure well like as i said for the jomon period this is a good way to segue in my own mind here the jomon period is the only cultural period for the entirety of japan that we agree was across the entirety of what is now modern japan so it's the only culture period that applies to any site found within a certain amount of time across those islands. So that means everything that comes after and before modern times was only limited to certain sections of the island. So all of the samurai stuff only really in South Central Japan. And any other time periods we bring up are going to be kind of limited in time and space. Uh, but even for something like the Jomon that we 
considered to have taken up 10,000 years across all of the islands. Uh, there's still so much regional variation and diversity that it also seems foolish to say it's all the same, because it's not. Just because we can say it's a similar culture period doesn't mean everyone's the same and it's showing up in the exact same stamp every time. And so this idea of modern Japan or historic Japan being all the same makes no sense. <laughs> And there are a bunch of reasons that kind of start with the Jomu period as to why this is absolute nonsense and where archaeology can actually help. Because archaeologically, we see so many cultures and societies across the islands. And the Jomon is kind of the base of that. So you said before that there's no real link between Jomon and ethnic Japanese people, it, there, there is, mm -hmm. but they're not the only ones with genetic or cultural claims to the Jomon period. Since in the North, the Jomon period was followed by several other cultural periods, ultimately culminating in what's known as the Ainu culture or medieval or historic Ainu. And the Ainu people very much still around. So they yeah. also have equal claim to Jomon stuff. And then in the south, in the Nanse, what some people know as the Ryukyus or Okinawa. But these two terms don't capture the entirety of those islands. They're kind of political geographic regions that maybe we can talk about more. We should, it's not, yeah. my, it's not my expertise, but a more inclusive term is Nanse, which just means southern islands. And that's everything from the south of Kyushu all the way to Taiwan. So that's like hundreds of islands that connect Japan to Taiwan. And uh, yeah, there's so many cultures within the Nansei alone that uh, we can't just refer to as like Ryukyu or Okinawa or Okinawa. So there's a lot going on and they also have equal ties to the Jomon period. What makes them all different is the genetic and cultural influences over time that came from various parts of mainland Asia and Southeast Asia and Far East Russia. Mm -hmm. Steve, so, Steve, you were going to say something? Yeah. I, I wanted to, I want to give them a break because you've been, you've been saying so many things that are just blowing my mind. So I wanted to give you a break. <laughs> uh, I wanted to first say that I definitely had in my bingo card if we were going to talk about the Ainu, and I'm so happy that we are, uh, because it's one of the my favorite episodes of Asian Percent. I think the information there, uh, even as someone who's uh, Asian as myself and lives in the West, I had never really heard of the Ainu before. Mm. And it feels really like shameful for me to say it. But to be honest, I don't think there's any shame in it because, you know, there's a reason why you haven't really heard of them if you're someone like me. Yeah. So, so talking about and making these connections, I think is actually really, really good. And Emma, to your points, kind of the idea of making those connections and better understanding the complexity of, all, of it all really helps, I think, to kind of bring to light uh, just the absolute beauty, the, the nuances of all of this, and really helps to break down the walls that have been built up to display a culture where you're really only focusing on, like you said, 4%, 2% of their history, because that yeah. is just by all measures, in my opinion, a bad thing to do. Yeah, if someone only knew 2% about you <laughs> and or like 2% of your life and based all of their judgments about you on that 2%, yeah. how are you going to feel? Now, Probably I, not great. <laughs> now, I think we should, we should make uh, a clarification. Sure. Uh, an important clarification that we should make is that if you're out there and you want to tell samurai stories, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know, if you are world building and you are in the process of world building and your thought process is, is if I want to communicate a Japanese setting, your default should not be feudal Japan and the samurai, or it doesn't have to be because there is so much more out there. Now, Emma, you mentioned a term um, mm. that I um, that I think, Steve, you, you had never heard of before, uh, just as we were getting ready, and that's Nihonjinron. Oh yeah. Can you do you want to explain that? As best I can. Yeah. 
<laughs> so Nihon is Japan and Ron is, I got to remember the character for this. Essentially, it's the study of what makes Japan what it is as a nation and a culture. And this, it became really a study or a discussion about what makes Japan unique and this idea of Japanese essence, uh, which are all like terrifying terms for a lot of people. And you should be alarmed if someone's like essentializing someone, like the essence of a whole group of people, just like back away from that. But the Nihon Jinron narrative and discussion comes from a particular time and place I believe mostly around World War II and immediately after. It has been carried on by a lot of the like ultra nationalists now, like the people who want to uh, censor the textbooks, essentially rewrite history or like they call it new history, which also super alarming. That idea that Japanese people and their culture are special, different, and that you can find these traits and attach them to every Japanese person. Some measure of Japanese-ness out there. Mm -hmm. And some of the Bushido samurai era, some of the philosophy coming out of like the Edo period, all really got wrapped up with that as well. Even though immediately after World War II, a lot of people really dropped anything and everything Bushido related because it had been so ingrained in the military system and in the emperor imperial system and that idea of the emperor's like divine rule, descent of the kami, all of that stuff. So yeah, a lot of history. Yeah. It's, it's so a sometimes, deep topic. Uh, yeah, and so sometimes when doing cultural consultancy, this is the kind of stuff that I know not a lot of people know, but some of your terms that you use, some of the ideas, all direct back to that narrative that is highly nationalistic, essentialist, and problematic in a lot of ways, and not widely believed by <laughs> people in Japan or Japanese diaspora. So it's stuff you have to be careful about. Yeah, with, with that, like, with that nationalism and that, like, that premise of, like, uniqueness and homogeneity. Because if you're going to, in this sort of Nihonjuron discourse, basically talk about, like, well, what makes Japan unique? Well, it's the people. Well, what are the people? It's these people. These people. These yep. people. And that's the really, that's the, that's the thing we need to discuss right now. And it's when you say these people, you're already engaging in this sort of cultural erasure that mm -hmm. Japan's history has seen a lot of, particularly when it comes to like the Ainu and the, um, the like the Nansei that you, that yeah, you talked the about. The Nansei Islanders and cultures, um, the Korean descent Japanese who have been there for millennia, uh, a lot of mixed. There's a lot of mixed uh, Japanese and Taiwanese that have been back and forth. There's a lot of mixed Portuguese, Dutch, everything else since the 14 and 1500s, like millennia of stuff going on. Even what's considered ethnic Japanese or, oh, don't want to use the term, but like Wajin or, mm -hmm. you know, who's being included in the Nihon Jinron are widely archeologically, genetically, and everything else considered to be descendants of Korean uh, migrants. So Korean and Jomon in particular peoples with a mass movement of people from the Korean Peninsula coming into Japan. That's when it's thought that for a long time, the Japanese people began. Are, are you talking about the like the Yayoi? The, the Yayoi. Kofun? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the Yayoi was when that happened in Kofun. It was more or less set up. They're like, yeah. hey, here we are. We're, we're a little kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> not across the entirety of Japan like I said like both Yayoi and Kofun are limited in how much of Japan modern Japan they took up mm -hmm. 
and, and I'm sure we'll 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 get to that. Um, you know, we we've mentioned. Um, I, I want to actually go back to the Ainu. I know Steve, you listened to that episode. That's actually episode 18 of the podcast. That feels like a long time ago. Different um, world, yeah. Different world. Um, but you know when you know we have this idea of like what makes Japan unique and what are what are the quintessential features of Japan, its history, and what should be communicated to the world. You know, we could do a lot as you know TTRPG creators, as people who you know work in pop culture, to tell different stories, or at least share different stories, or have conversations about it. Um, Steve, you mentioned that you you didn't know about the Ainu or anything like that, or have never seen the Ainu. Um, but there are two really popular uh, sources of Ainu visibility that that people. Uh, often encounter the first one is more recent and it's golden kamui um and it's you know from what i gathered you know reinvigorated a lot of interest in the ainu particularly in young people and mm -hmm. in the west fans of the anime um and then a, a, another one more a more classic one which was how i learned about the ainu was shaman king um and one of the uh. characters in shaman king the, the snowboarder, <laughs> um, Horo Horo, <laughs> has a lot of Ainu iconography, not only on his like modern contemporary clothing, but also the kind of traditional objects that he uses um, mm -hmm. in that series. And I think that's really interesting, uh, particularly with Shaman King, because you have uh, a show or, or like a manga series where the central character's companion is very much a samurai or coded as like a samurai. Um, and you have this one character who is, um, who is, I say different, but not an outsider. Um, different. He stands out. He is unique. Um, when we look at Breath of the Wild, um, we look at the, the ancient technology, the guardians, the, the, the slate, everything like that. It's different. It's mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you go and you look at something like Oriental Adventures or Caratour, and you're just like, Oh, great. Kozakura and Wa, that's just Japan. Or like all of the warriors here, they are just samurai. And yeah. it's A, you've, yeah. <laughs> A, you've seen it. And B, they're basically taking these tropes and these, uh, you see, like almost like artificial symbols of a, of a history and multiple cultures. Because first of all, there are many cultures in Japan, like Emma said. And you're basically saying this is Japan. It blows my mind too that for a caricature, they're like, nah, we need two feudal Japans. Yeah, yeah. And Not they're like right one, next to each we other. Need two of them. <laughs> yeah, because there's two Chinas and there's two Japans in Caratour. Perfect. Yeah. We, we just haven't we haven't <laughs> we just haven't gotten to the second China yet, Emma. We'll we'll get oh, there goodness. in like ten years. I wish um, I had never heard that expression in my life before. What the, what, what the <laughs> we haven't got to the second China yet. We, we haven't got to the second China yet. Yeah, we haven't got to that one yet, and we haven't got... We, we haven't even really got to Japan yet in Caratour. We just got to a part in one of the Chinas where <laughs> their city is literally, we can see Japan, and that's their identity. Yeah. Um, it's wild. Um, but, like, I think, you know, talking about, like, the, you know, the, the political and the, the sort of educational movements to create this sort of yeah. post-World War II unique Japan it is, again, it's not something that's exclusive to Japan. China is also, um, you know, responsible for doing something like that as well, um, post-World War II. Um, and that affects their scholarship. And if it affects their scholarship, it affects, you know, how young people grow up and learn and what kind of things you see in media. Um, and I think the Ainu are, are one that I think is, is particularly tragic, uh, mm -hmm. not only from, like, how they've been like fucked over in the past historically but how they continue you know to experience an immense amount of like discrimination not only just in mm -hmm. society but in like legislation and politics yeah. um so it was only in the last five years or so that they were granted like official minority status and it was i think or maybe i have this the other way around I think recently they were given indigenous status and in 1998 they were 
officially declared a, an ethnic minority, which all had like legal, legal ramifications and uh, yeah, a lot of stuff related to that. But really, it's not surprising, like don't feel bad that you haven't heard about the Ainu in North America, because one, North America doesn't even cover its own indigenous issues, let alone international ones. So of course we're not going to get taught about any of this. But if it helps put it into context, what happened to the Ainu peoples, especially starting with the Meiji Restoration in 1868, is actually directly modeled off of what happened to North American Indigenous peoples. Because Japan brought in specialists from the American Midwest to help them, quote unquote, eradicate their, their Indigenous problem and to set up ranching and farming. So yeah, a whole lot of That's a yikes Americans for me. and British yeah. dudes and American experts came in, not just to tell them how to like raise cattle in the North, but how to best get rid of, you know, a local population, which they, they like for them was making reserves, telling them how to live their lives and killing their dogs because dogs were the symbol of I knew independence and hunting practices. So yeah, they, yeah, <laughs> it's a super rough period of time. Yeah. And I think it's only alluded to in like, if you think about mainstream Western media, I think the only time I can recall that particular practice ever being alluded to is, is in, is in the last samurai. Um, uh, that Tom Cruise movie, because Tom Cruise's character in that movie is literally brought in from the West for that reason. Um, and then of course that movie has a whole slew of problems. Um, yeah. But that, that, that particular practice that you mentioned is, is actually featured in the movie, um, which I just thought about right now. Um, the whole thing with the Ainu, I, 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 of, I often find is like really interesting because you know, there's this idea of like, what is modern, what is industrial, what is imperial, and what yeah. is savage. And then there are, yeah. is, of course, a lot of discourse around the Jomon with regards to like hunting and gathering and agriculture. Yeah. And, you know, for, from like if you're like just like te you're just listening to this this podcast or watching it, you're probably thinking, well, OK, you know, this um, entire like hunter gatherer agriculturists both sound interesting. What's you know, what's the difference? Right. But then when you think about how, you know, agriculture is seen as modern western european mm -hmm. right forward thinking and then you think about hunting and gathering and how that is backwards and not modern and savage romantic. and primitive and romantic right then you start to equate these like prehistoric cultures or yeah. these contemporary cultures with their traditional practices and these views of how you know the world perceives of japan uh, and it's sad. And also how Japan perceives itself a little. Yeah. In particular, like government and uh, there, there is still a national narrative because it's taught through elementary schools and it's shown in museums. Uh, mo well, I'd say the vast majority of the Japanese public is not well informed about the vast majority of history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's another thing. Like not everyone in Japan even knows this stuff. But yeah, that idea of a romantic past and the turning point at which everyone becomes modern is really a bit of a fallacy. And archaeologists are very familiar with it, but I think it's still sold to wider public because it's easy. Instead of saying it's an extended process that never really ends and you don't just wake up one morning growing crops, like uh, <laughs> there's no clear division. But it's real nice, especially if you're going through something like an economic bust, like they did in the 90s, and then everything industrial and modern becomes tiring or a source of anger and hurt. You're going to turn to parts of the past that things were, a bit, that seemed easier or nicer. And you get the sort of obsession with time periods like the Jomon, because they're idyllic in a lot of people's minds, or samurai periods, because there was a sense of order and structure that 
was lacking, especially in the post nineties economic bubble bursting. Like what do we need? Well, the past is often a band aid for things going poorly in the present. Mm -hmm. We do it here. It happens everywhere. If the current times are crap, like, oh, it was so much better then. <laughs> but of course, you're going to gloss over all the complications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's sad. It, it's complicated. And I, and I think that's why, you know, conversations like this are really important because we can talk about how we can inspire others to look into these things. Um, that's why I think like, you know, Breath of the Wild is a really interesting example of how, you know, the world and and Japan are embracing symbols of the Jomo um, mm -hmm. in a way they like really hadn't before. Not to this degree, not to this degree. I don't no. think I don't think there's anything like it. And I think what's really interesting is that, you know, in in Breath of the Wild, that ancient technology is seen and is portrayed as more advanced than yeah. the current technology absolutely sort of lost past yeah mm -hmm. i found that super interesting because a lot of the times the past especially that deep is shown as sort of technologically behind they're more magical usually they're like mysterious and interesting and yeah it's uh i'd say common to do that and i understand why but Rarely do you talk about a past group be having their shit figured out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which yeah. for the, the Jomon, we know they did because, like, you don't stick around for ten thousand years with very <laughs> minimal changes to your basic practices with without having something figured out. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even even that. And I mean, Emma, you know that I am still deeply obsessed with that middle Jomon pottery. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Like they're, <laughs> so they're... plain steel pottery. If anyone wants to search uh, Jomon, J O M O N, just search Jomon pottery, That's, or you're gonna get that pottery. <laughs> you're going to get flame style pottery, and yeah. And I think I, the oh, go ahead, Steve. I was gonna comment on the Breath of the Wild piece. So, have way I, I only finished my first Divine Beast, so I'm not that far in the game. Oh, sorry, uh, I won't ruin it. Okay, okay, <laughs> no, so, no so spoiling to it. But what I will say oh, is that I love it so much. I had a when I first started playing all the Sheikah stuff, mm -hmm. I knew they were like channeling some kind of culture. I didn't know what it was. My gut feel was like, oh, it's just some kind of like Orientalist mishmash, whatnot. So when you told me and gave me these links, I was ecstatic. I was like, yeah, tell me more about that. Uh, and what I really like about Breath of the Wild is that, like you said, this old power is like ancient and powerful and to be respected. And in most cases, in my playthrough, feared. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's coming for it's you. It's coming for yeah. you. You, you, yeah. see the, you see the like the beam is like. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah. I'm dead. So, yeah. Like I'm, I'm going to I'm going to die. S sorry, my horse that I have. Um, <laughs> but. I have assumed based on how like I'm playing through the game that the story is eventually going to be that the understanding of your past based on other mechanics of the game, when you understand your past and you respect it and you engage with it, that is where your power comes from. And that's like a really powerful message. And I really hope that as I play through that that theme is reinforced and whatnot. Maybe it doesn't and that's fine, but I still get to walk away with that feel that there was definitely that potential there to just talk about how the complexities the nuances all that stuff that make up who you are today that is a source of power i think that's mm. really really interesting and i really really like that yeah i mean e i mean we're definitely not going to spoil anything for you if you've only done one yeah. divine beast there's um, only four of them what <laughs> but, there, but, there's, say... but there's so much to do in that game i don't want to it's okay, an experience fair. i don't want to you know ruin anything it for is. you. Steve. i love it so much okay, okay. and i say that as an archaeologist who studies the jomon there wasn't anything within that game that I went, oh, about. <laughs> yeah. And largely it is because they are using the aesthetic, but they did it in a way that was interesting. So it wasn't just slapped on. Like you said, Steve, it was this exploration of both personal past and deep past. And that, yeah, rings true for a lot of us, but the way that they did it with the Jomon period, I thought was really well done. It also started a burst of conversation in Japan about the Jomon period. So we do see some of what they call like tangential learning, 
where yeah. for people in Japan, at least, they'll be like, oh, I recognize that from like school or going to the museum one time or a lot of local communities have so many products and things if there's like a popular jomon or famous jomon site or artifact from that town it'll be everywhere well like a good example sanamariyama is yeah huge they like stopped they stopped building they a were, baseball stadium yeah they were building a professional this. baseball stadiums and they found a jomon site that took up the entirety of their plan no way <laughs> i'll i'll um i'll share it in the uh the it's cool the name in the Twitch chat so you folks can look it up. Um, Sanai Mariyama. Uh, it is really cool. Um, it's on my list of like things in Japan that I want to see. Um, so they, it's, they, it's they, rad. So, like, so, they're, so they were building a baseball stadium <laughs> right. and in digging up the foundation and building it, they found an archaeological site. And they were like, stop. Okay, so yeah. they did stop. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. in Japan, you stop. You, it's, yeah, okay. you stop. Yeah. Japan protects its what they call buried cultural properties mm -hmm. very, very tightly. So it so a, took some rallying to make it into a permanent park, but excavating and preserving was never a question. Gotcha. Yeah. And yeah. the reason I want to ask that is because with the idea of like, you know, reconnect with your past in what I would call constructive and positive way in Western media and a lot of the tabletop RPGs that I play, when it comes to kind of the indigenous people, the people that were mm. there first, their power, their history and stuff is usually not seen exactly. as a source of power. Hey, St it, hey, hey, Steve, you know, in the latest Dungeons and Asians episode that isn't out yet, did you yeah. notice it? You notice a theme there? I absolutely did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was out in, in that particular episode, I was definitely throwing you a little bit of kind of how modern education and, mm. uh, you know, people in power how they will change that narrative in ways that yeah. are still baseline. So if you just do a little bit of research, it seems like up to snuff. But uh, if you do any other digging, you realize it's all lies. It's all lies yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. That yeah. said, I wanted to give an example of Shadowrun, which really leans into the, the old, old powers and power structures of Native Americans, Indigenous folk, and how in Shadowrun, it's completely played out, off as a thing to fear as something mm. uncontrollable, wild, and something to be contained. Yeah. Yep. And that is a very specific choice you make in, a, in designing a game. And in recent iterations, I will say they've tried better. They've tried to move away from it. But the fact of the matter is, it started at point A, and regardless of where point B is, there's always that line to it. So in my opinion, Shadowrun has held, handled that quite disgustingly. But I, I, when I see media like Breath of the Wild, I feel like good about it. And there's there's yeah, also well, something there's also something to be said about about like the the choice of using the Jomo. And when a lot of people are working on a TTRPG and they're like, Well, I want to do Japan and then you go and then you basically search Japanese history and you, you will invariably find like the Edo, right? And you're you're gonna find samurai, you're gonna see things about Bushido, you if you dig deep enough, you might be like, oh, I'll go to the library and read the Chrysanthemum and the Sword. Um, please don't. Please don't. Um, that's <laughs> just very dated, uh, which we will talk about in another episode. Look of the up podcast. about Ruth Benedict, though. She was yeah. a baller, but um, like, don't read that book. Don't read that book. <laughs> um, and, you know, there is a lot of information out there, and a lot of people lean into that information without an understanding of its context, i.e., Ruth Benedict and Chrysanthemum and the Sword. Um, the cool thing about the Jomon, and this is exactly what Nintendo did with Breath of the Wild, is that a lot is unknown about the Jomon because of how old it is. They, they, well, not anymore because China's kind of got it now, but they have, at one point they were like, we have the oldest pottery in the world. Um, yeah. Not anymore. Um, 16,500 years old. Yeah. And then they found there's, there's a Xianran Dong in, in China is like 20K. Into, something wild something yeah. wild Twenty thousand years old and like the stuff that i was working on for when i was doing like my doctorate was like only twelve thousand years old and then the jomon stuff that i did on my master's was was like early jomon so it's only eight thousand eight thousand yeah yeah but like <laughs> only 8, only eight thousand yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like that's, a very play. that's like a very archaeology just, thing to say yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I have to catch myself when it's just like, oh, that was only like 500 years ago. I'm like, oh, that's 
That's a uh, lot sp- to people. <laughs> yeah. But but like the thing is like there's not a lot of context as to like the maybe the language they spoke, the writing. Oh, yeah, we I have all we have is this material culture, stone tools. We have if a they, lot of it. Or if they if they have a subscription to some sort of academic journal, learn about starch from Dr. Emma Yasui. Um <laughs> but really I can like, just tell you if you're in the <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, I feel like your mom did so much. They did so like, much, and we have a lot of it. But like, it's like having a puzzle where all the the picture pe- parts have been pulled off, and you're just like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But but there's a freedom in that, and there's a freedom in that, and that's what Nintendo did. They're like, they have this beautiful, iconic, material culture, and we are going to draw inspiration from it. Like, it, there are like two things in Breath of the Wild. It's like the middle Jomon f- flame pottery, and mm-hmm. then there's the Jomon dogu. Yeah. And the, the figurines yeah. um, that they have. And they were able to basically take the sort of um, the visual language mm-hmm. of the Jomon and incorporate that into their game world in a way that was unproblematic. Um, for, yeah, which was They unproblem- didn't really make any claims with yeah. it. And... That's nice to see as an archaeologist. There wasn't any, like, nationalist rhetoric or anything. Well, that also is partly because it's a fantasy world and Zelda is removed from Japanese history and Mm -hmm. all of that. But it is worth noting that it was well done partly because the Jomon is so open, but also it was done by a team of Japanese people. For a Japanese audience, even though I'm sure Nintendo fully intended to send it elsewhere, that nod to Japanese prehistory was not for an international audience. They're like, look how cool this looks. Not like, recognize the Jomon? Yeah, that's for you. <laughs> yeah, like literally when, when I was playing it, I st- when I, the, the first sign of anything Jomon, I was like, whoa, hold yeah. up. It's undeniable. <laughs> And, like, I have very fond memories of Middle Jomon Pottery because I tried to make one myself. How'd it go, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, you, you know what? You know what? <laughs> so um, I have a book here, the pottery that we're talking about. So this is, this is like, a very accessible introduction that there, you could certainly, and scholars will disagree with some things in this book, but, like, I'm, you know, I'm done. Um, yeah, I, so like, yeah. so there. This is the the ancient Jomon of Japan by Junko Habu. Who is I really like, like Junko, but I got beef with yeah. some of her stuff. <laughs> I know, I I do too. I do I do too with this book. But for the time being, this is a very inexpensive and accessible introduction mm-hmm. to the Jomon. Um, but uh, that's the kind of pottery that we're talking about. You yeah. go like this, and you put the ground here, and it's you Breath of the yourself- Wild. You got yourself a shrine or a guardian, you know? I tried to make one of these. <laughs> it, you fool. Yeah. You know what? It's all coil pottery I with try, applique. Well, and... So I tried, to, <laughs> I tried to make one, but I was like, I got cocky. And I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to quarry the clay myself. I'm going to process <laughs> the clay, and I'm going to make the clay workable, and then I'm going to build it. It took me a month to make something like, it's like this big. <laughs> And then yeah. it sat on my desk here, and I had dice in it for a long time. Um, but the process of making it, you know, gave me a very f- deep appreciation for, for that material culture. And I think it's really cool, um, and it was really awesome to see it in Breath of the Wild. So when we go into our tabletop RPGs, because I think we should try to talk about other things too, mm. I think there is a lot of inspiration to be drawn from yeah. in periods of Japan's very vast culture history yeah. uh, that you don't see. And so if you're out there and you're working on, you know, a setting and, you know, for your home game, uh, like you have a rabbit folk character named Hibiki in your game and you need to like <laughs> do some give stuff, them give them a backstory <laughs> like Emma did, like pay attention. Um, so like we've talked at length about the Jomon because they're like a really good example of how, you know, people can incorporate iconic Mm -hmm. and very mysterious looking imagery into their games. Yeah. And I don't know if discourse about this has changed, Emma, but like last time you and I talked about Jomon Dogu, those ceramic figurines, because I know you have got that little like necklace. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that 
the Jomon Dogu have these patterns all over them that mm-hmm. might be related to ancient tattooing practices. Is that still they, like in the discourse? They think they were tattooed. Uh, we know they had stretched ear piercings because we find a lot of the ceramic spacers uh, earrings. They're spacers with intricate designs on them. So they were stretching their ears. There were some regions where they were even modifying their teeth. So they would knock some out in patterns or file them into shapes. <laughs> So these were some rad looking people and (laughs) (laughs) definitely think they were covered in tattoos or tattooing was a thing or acceptable. And And that's pretty much true of most of Japanese history up until some of the feudal times. Yeah, the tattoo was kind of something that I kind of wanted us to lean into because, you know, when a lot of people think of like, oh, tattoos, Japan, Yakuza, Yakuza, a forbidden practice, and you can't show these things in public. They won't let you into a bathhouse. Um, But in other parts of Japan, uh, unfortunately, this practice has experienced a lot of erasure. Mm -hmm. But tattoos are are symbols, Um, particularly with like contemporary groups like the Ainu. Uh, I knew women have those lip tattoos and those really intricate armbands. Yeah. Um, and so when you're thinking about your fantasy settings and you're thinking about like, oh, you know, what are ways in which my the fantasy cultures I'm making, what are ways in which they can stand out? Um, what are ways in which I can make them feel unique but not exotic to my world? How do I make my world feel different? How do I make my world feel unique? Because even from a business perspective, there are so many samurai games out there. How do you stand out? How do you have your product yeah. stand out? How do you have your world feel interesting? And I think the the Jomo, with, not only with their ceramics, but with the Dogu and then potential tattooing, I think is a really interesting, and like teeth and earrings. Come on. Yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. But even at yeah. a grander scale, because I know that the Kofun is another really cool one because not only is how their you know society is structured very different from the jomo but so are their monuments yeah so (laughs) for a bit of context so the jomo period after that we have the yayoi which we talked about earlier Mm -hmm. where we have that big influx of population from the korean peninsula in the sort of south central area of japan uh, they bring with them metallurgy, so you get bronze Those... and iron around the same time in Japan. And they bring rice agriculture, so pa- the wet paddy rice. And things start to change quite a bit near the end where we start to see our first uh, sort of what we call polities or what someone might have called a chiefdom back in the day, but archaeologists don't really use the term anymore. <laughs> so they're little independent political units that have a little more power than just a village, but they're not yet a state level society. That happens more within the Kofun period, which comes next. And so what people might know of from the Yayoi period leading into the Kofun is a person named Himiko. If anyone's heard of a uh, Queen Himiko, uh, she shows up in a lot of video games and things. She also gets conflated with Amaterasu a lot. So some of the imagery that we see with Amaterasu is also on Queen Himiko, who is the first recorded ruler of Japan, quote unquote Japan. Uh, And it's some of the first record of anything happening in Japan, and it's coming from the Book of Song. So most of what we know about early Japanese history is being recorded by Chinese uh, empires and travelers. I feel like you're about to drop on me that the Lara Croft video game and movie, the new ones, actually don't do Himiko, uh, Queen Himiko much justice. Oh yeah, that's right. (laughs) I have a good feel. I forgot about that. (laughs) You forgot? So, well, I forgot to remind that, you. I forgot yeah, about that. Yeah. I actually had a student write about the representations of Himiko in <laughs> video games. But yeah, so Himiko and the Lost Kingdom or whatever. I haven't actually watched it because I don't think my rage meter can handle it. Um, 
Himiko is interesting because she gets used in so many ways in popular media. She's either like that benevolent leader, sometimes she's a crazy witch, other times she's this like, like seductress who's just out to ruin everyone. Uh, she's often depicted as mentally unwell, not entirely sure why. Because all we know of her is what's written in like half a page where it says, here's this woman, we're going to call the place she rules Wa. Uh, she rules alongside her brother. She's a shamaness. And I think that's about all we have for her. <laughs> <laughs> also, Wa. She's a bit of a King Arthur uh, character. Gotcha. So nothing as far as the books say about, you know, having a mystical plague within her body. <laughs> Yeah, or like that's what's the the, oh. the the Tomb Raider game, the the reboot game, where it's just like sun powers and all that. I, I didn't really so, like the first game. I don't know, like the whole plague thing and that idea of Himiko trying to find a way to cure herself. I don't know where that came from, but it shows up in Osama Tezuka's comics, uh, Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix series, and I'm wondering if. Tezuka started that or if there's something I'm missing because I haven't actually sat down and been like tell me everything there is to know about Himiko like do we have evidence like first of all I don't think we've ever found her remains so we can't evaluate if she was ill it's not written in the records we do know she passed away because everyone does but like <laughs> we don't know <laughs> yeah. why I think there's just a note that her niece takes over after her so it's a series of female rulers in Japan in the earliest records. Yeah. Um, and like, that's it. I don't know about this. She's crazy and diseased. I don't know where that came <laughs> from. Yeah. And, and, and possibly more importantly, because it is fine to have, obviously, like historical figures that you don't know much about because that's history. And that's like, <laughs> we try our best. But yeah. in the Tomb Raider series, um, both the video game and the movie, the story centers around white voices going to this island to raid a tomb uh very clearly a place of resting and respect As to take yeah. to take away their treasures or to stop someone else from taking away yeah. their treasures and at the end of it the result is the tomb lies in obscurity because it's too dangerous to give it back to the people who might actually take value from it so that is obviously that is the main tension about it not necessarily yeah. the fact that we don't know who himiko is because that yeah. is obviously work in progress that's so that's a lot i actually there's an interesting paper about the various representations of himiko and how she's been used for like social and political means but like my question is what did her tomb look like <laughs> yeah right but this, this this kind of mystery right uh i mean because you with the yayoi because we're i think there are two important things that kind of stand out in our conversations uh about the yayoi um I think the first one is obviously like metallurgy, right? Those dotaku yeah. bells are like beautiful, very intricate, yeah. right? And the introduction of like bronze and iron working. Oh yeah, so is like really uh, cool. What are they called? If anyone's played Pokemon, you've seen both Dogu, the bells, and the mirrors. Bronze ore is this, this is why we got you, Steve. This is why we got you. <laughs> <laughs> Claydol, yeah, and. I got. I have to I look think, that up. I think the bell's just called Dotaku. I might be wrong, or it's Do something. Oh, clay doll's just a dogu. Yeah, it's a dogu. It's literally just a dogu. Yeah. Yeah, and then bronze or I remember that one because it's a bronze mirror. That's easy enough. Oh yeah, br br bronzong, bronzong, bronzong. Yeah. That's well, the, that's I was a, wrong. That's a Dotaku know. for sure. Um, oh damn. But that's yeah, cool. so what were we even talking? Oh about? yeah, so so I was saying. <laughs> for the yeah, so I, I got distracted by Pokemon because I I don't have a lot of Pokemon knowledge past basically gold silver. Anyways, um, we're talking about the Yayoi. Basically, the Jom. I want to summarize things. I want to kind of rein things in, right? Mm. Um, for the yeah. Jomon, we kind of talked about really like really interesting um, material culture that can be used. Or, or potential practices that can be used to inspire your TTRPG settings or your stories. In the Jomon, we talked about their very, very unique pottery. We talked about the Dogu, those figurines. Mm -hmm. We talked about like ear spacers, teeth modifications, as well as potential tattooing. Um, they were doing just about everything. Yeah, 
as as you know, and they of course have these like very very beautiful settlements. Sanai Marayama, mm -hmm. gorgeous. It's a park you can go visit, um, and you can yeah. see everything on it. It's really neat. Um, then of course when we're talking about the yayoi, we're talking about you know metallurgy. We're talking about a period in time where people were coming from the Korean Peninsula over into Japan and bringing mm -hmm. in new technologies, new ideas, right? And this sort of cultural exchange in yeah. and of itself is a really cool thing to have in your story where you yeah. have, you know, these Jomon people or these people inspired by the Jomon who have this very, very intricate technology and how they maybe change, adapt, engage in conflict or, mm -hmm. you know, coexist with these foreigners coming yeah. into their land um, who bring metallurgy and have mm. this mysterious queen right and these a, are all things a good, you... a good little lesson from the yayoi period as well is even though what's become like the core of japan that so central area even though things were changing quite rapidly during the yayoi period there that doesn't mean elsewhere in the islands that things were stagnating they were changing as well they just weren't doing the same thing and this is i think once we get into the Kofun period, where we can talk about the Emishi. But first, like, I asked about Himiko's tomb and the Tomb Raider. Right, right. <laughs> because there are some guesses as to Himiko's tomb. Because around the end of the Ayoi, they started making these massive earthen mounds that were in the shape of a keyhole. So, like, bloop on top and then a bit of a triangle at the bottom. And those become really common during the Kofun period. So Kofun itself means like ancient tomb. Although if you put it through like Google Translate, I think for a long time it was coming out as like dirt castle. I was like, Dirt oh. castle. <laughs> 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 like the ancient dirt castle. I'm like, mm, thanks for that. But <laughs> like an er earth, rammed earth. <laughs> yeah. So lots of earth, moats, they, there's this wide interpretation that they were trying to simulate a mountain because the tops of the mountains and the interiors are where the other world exists and how you get to things like Kami and the spirits and the powers of the earth that aren't human. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea that you are returning leaders into the mountains, into essentially like the womb of the earth. And there's a whole lot going on there. Can we ever prove that? Absolutely not. <laughs> but that's great storytelling. It's for great for stories. Um, but yeah, like uh, I've been working on a bit of a a source guide for TTRPGs for the Kofun period, and I kind of would like to make one for some of the other archaeological periods, where I, as an archaeologist, summarize what is known, and then give you some things that you can work with. But I also want to include a section for each one about the history of how the period has been studied and talked about and where you might run into issues of sensitivity and uh, like discourses you're not familiar with. So the Kofun period, it's big like uh, uncomfortable zone is that it is widely considered the period where the beginning of the imperial line resides so the first emperors the first sons of the sun goddess that go unbroken until like world war ii and even now so technically the emperor of japan is a descendant of the sun goddess amaterasu technically i don't know if they're they go around saying that anymore <laughs> it's like, look at me <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm the child of the sun like they don't really do that anymore but there was a lot of rhetoric and narrative around the Kofun period in particular. And you have to be careful if you're going to draw from time periods like this and what resources you're using. And so I just kind of wanted to, with the, the privilege I have of being not just archaeologically trained, but also Japanese descent diaspora, like to evaluate some of this and as someone who goes in and out of Japan and sees how it's done there. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot. So it might take a while, fam, but I'm working on it. And, and then there are people who are <laughs> going to be like, just take my money. <laughs> I think it's, you know, I think it's really important for, you know, 
people like you, Emma, to to be in this space, not like Asians represent in particular, but like in the TTRPG space, mm. um, because it's, you know, viewpoints like yours and expertise like yours yeah. that the industry needs to move forward, right? Um, a lot of people don't understand or, or, or perhaps just don't think about how the context in which history is being written and how that affects what is passed down and then how that affects what kind of knowledge is being produced. Um, yeah. And that in and of itself is a really important conversation um, to have. Um, so, yeah, I, I think like the Kofun is one that I was like, you know, of the, so we basically wrote down Jomo, Yayoi, Kofun slash Inishi. And yeah. of the three, like the Jomo and the Yayoi are the ones that I personally would lean into if I were creating something because of the, the complexities of the Kofun. Right. Yeah. And the, the, the sort of the, the political ramifications of a fiction you might write from a very, very culturally important time period. While yeah. like the, the, the Kofun themselves, like the, the tombs are really, really cool. Like that, um, that, uh, I was looking up before the Daisen Kofun, the huge one from it's the massive. sky. It's massive actually, and it looks like a keyhole, literal it keyhole. Does. It has like, a big shape around it, then a keyhole in the center and a moat filling the rest of it. And what's interesting is you can't see them from the ground. They just look like mountains. They're covered in woods and there's like lakes around them. They're huge. It's, um, it's in the, um, I think you can find, a... oh, go ahead, you sorry. can find them on Google earth. You can see them from the satellites. And once you find one, you'll see all of the others around it because they always come in clusters. So there's, hundreds of them and you can see all of them from google earth yeah from the satellites yeah. steve i just i just sent you a picture of of that particular one or one of They're them cool. heck yeah and uh, we don't really know what's our, in them <laughs> this comes back to the politics we don't really know what's in them because they are potentially the tombs of emperors the imperial house agency doesn't allow people to excavate and so there have been some like ground penetrating radar attempts at, you know, getting an idea of what's in there. But for the most part, like it's rare to excavate one. It really has to be crossed off the list as probably not an emperor or imperial line before you can get in there. And so there's a lot of like speculation as to who's in there and why it's significant because something that big is probably for someone really important, but like, a key, Who? but a, a key keyhole shaped tomb is a very you know narratively interesting thing to include in your mm. world. Now, if like I think Emma, correct me if I'm wrong, you might be saying, "Hey, maybe avoid calling it like, hey, this is a Kofun thing because yeah. the thing there." But a, a keyhole shaped tomb that you can only see from the sky is really neat because you could you could you could craft an entire fiction around it where like the gods have the keys into the earth and there are all of these keyhole shaped tombs all over the place and one day the gods yeah. reach down from the sky and unlock the earth and there you go there's, there's a, a there's, there's a your lot campaign. you can do <laughs> but yeah that's the thing with the narrative there are just certain things you should avoid like you know imperial lines perhaps or yeah. <laughs> some of that uh, divine rule like maybe just don't don't fuss with it if you don't want to dig into everything and the history surrounding those ideas and i've said this before like when using the past in any way there are some things to keep in mind like one talk about past cultures like you would living ones especially if there are descendants like living extant descendants but even not like the jomon period just talk about them like they're people if you wouldn't say it about someone's culture who's standing right in front of you don't say it about peoples that have been even if they've been dead for a long time mm -hmm. and then two like i'm afraid there's just a lot of research you gotta do not just into the details of the time period but into the how it's been talked about how it's been studied how it's been used or what we call like the historiography of it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just part of it. Yeah, And like, I would like to make that a little easier for some of these things. <laughs> yeah, But I'm just one person, so. You're just one yeah. person, but one person's got to start. You, you, 
you got to be the one to do it. And I, and you know what? I think, I really think that, you know, I mean, first of all, people hire Emma <laughs> if you got the bandwidth, Emma. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many projects. Like, I mean, you and I worked on one together, and that was really cool because it was like great. we've worked on academic stuff together. Yeah. Because <laughs> you looked at starch that I had on my stuff. It's and, true, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I looked at some of your pottery. You looked at some of my pottery. <laughs> yeah. And then it, the one that's not as old as the, some of the Jomo stuff. But, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, we worked on a TTRPG thing together. And yeah. that's a really cool thing because it's like, I, I, I mean, selfishly, it's like, oh, my world's colliding. Um, mm. But also it's like scholarship and how scholarship can really impact things that like games, things that you might mm -hmm. think are inconsequential. Um, Something else that's really cool about the Kofun period related to another project I said I would do that I've only part done is uh, <laughs> the Kofun period is when horses arrive in Japan. So, oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh I, you mentioned this before. And I, uh, it's so good. I really want to do a guide, like a guide for people who work in like fantasy settings. Like, what is a horse? How does it go together? As well as like a sort of a rundown of like horse breeds in Asia, as well as the tack and things that people use with them. Yeah. Well, like, that's that's a big one. But so the Kofun period's cool because that's when we get our first horses in Japan. And guess what? They're small. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing. So if you're like doing a Jomon inspired thing, you'd be like, don't do horses. No horses. They or have or dogs. maybe they maybe they have dogs. Maybe they're all like dire wolves or dire dogs and they some cool things like that right yeah. um I, I had this video idea um because of like you know S steve you 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 know her as well tracy from the broadswords mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh tracy rides horses mm -hmm. and and i was like you know what we should do we should go ride horses with tracy and do like a whole asians represent video thing i was going to talk to you about this too emma and we could do a whole <laughs> video and ride horses how fun yeah, would i grew that up be? with horses that'd be so fun be interesting because horses scare the shit out of me. Yo, Emma, they, Emma, they are terrifying. Yo, Emma, t tell the it's tell fine. the audience the story. But when you got kicked in the face, that's the story. I got kicked in the <laughs> face. <laughs> Actually, I think I told this on L Five R Street. Yeah, you, you, I just did. got kicked in the face by a horse. I was three, and yeah, I got kicked in the face right around here. Uh, I flew back and hit my head off of a pole, which apparently saved my brain because my skull fractured in two directions instead of just one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that happens. And here yeah. I am. <laughs> look, look, children can bounce back. It's fine. Three years old. I did. It basically invincible. I did. Uh, have basically. A question. Uh, what I was going to mention here was that Daniel, I don't even remember back in the Oriental Adventures live read that we did. Um, we actually dissected a little bit about the horses and whatnot, and how the authors, all of them really much wanted to point that the uh asian people i almost said the oriental people the oh, asian no, <laughs> you, you you heard it audience steve from asians represent <laughs> yeah yeah put a stamp on that steve said it's okay oh. um no. <laughs> but we we actually dissected that as kind of like a em emasculation of asian people where the samurai the knights of this area would ride mm -hmm. ponies and then the yeah. big knights the big boy knights of the western culture would wear ride horses but emma your context of actually <laughs> they showed up very late and now they have like these smaller horses blah blah, blah it has a historical context that completely changes the reading there mm -hmm. uh, so just another example even this short time period that we've had of just kind of this extra context here has lent itself to helping us move through and understand better deconstruct even our own ways of deconstructing yeah like, like orientalist views of of media yeah. see but you you're, so, you're yeah. are you referring to the 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 section of the book when they're describing the knight and then there's like oh yes then there's the oriental it's the samurai and he's got like eight arms like one for the bow one for the spear one for the sword is, is it that that section it's exactly about? that yeah. okay so the knight the knight gets like four paragraphs describing how cool they are and the japanese samurai gets one paragraph talking about how they sit with a whole bunch of colorful silk on a stool with their pony and with tons like, of weapons. Well, <laughs> cool. Oh <my> like, <laughs> cool. Right. So like, yeah, fair. Like European, like they were called destroyers. Like they were large horses. Yeah. But like 
most of the Asian ones were what we would classify as ponies. So under 14.3 hands high. So they were. I like how you said that. Like I would know the difference. Oh, I was like, if, you said, <laughs> if you said 15 hands, I'd be like, cool. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the Japanese breeds and a lot of the like Eurasian step ones are probably maxing out at about 12, 13 hands high. And the smallest ones are around 10. So even if you don't know what that means, at least you have a relative idea. Right compared to uh, a medieval destroyer, which might be like 16 hands high. So like 10 versus 16. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I... a lot of yeah, the breeds are quite small, but that doesn't make them ineffective. They still had a huge impact. And uh, Japanese horses came in around four to 500 AD or common era CE and didn't change until I think closer to World War One and Two, when they actually saw European horses and went, oh, so small, we should make better. <laughs> so small. <laughs> so small. And started crossbreeding Japanese horses with European ones. And so there's actually a protection movement for like keeping some of the Japanese breeds going. Because, yeah, they're cute. One other yeah. thing that I wanted to talk about, and it particularly as it like relates to your research emma is sure. also also food food is a big one yeah food is a huge one uh, especially when we're talking about like research that's been done on the jomo the yayoi the kofun yeah whatever you see ttrpgs that are talking about like asia they're always like raw fish sushi rice yeah. and when you're looking into you know a lot like particularly the research around the Jomon and early agriculture and the Yayoi and the introduction of r rice, like you said. Yeah. It's like th these are things that should be included in your game because like we talked about on the wrap up, like food can go a really long way in making your fantasy cultures feel unique. Yeah. And that's something you brought up, uh, Golden Kamoi earlier for talking about the Ainu. And like should be noted, that's it's not made by an Ainu person mm -hmm. so you still need to be careful with that but one of the big things they do to talk about the differences and similarities between the main characters the Japanese guy and the Ainu girl is they eat a lot together they show a lot of the food in high detail they even go through the process of making some of the meals and, and it's all regionally correct because the guy might not be Ainu, but he did grow up in Hokkaido, and so it's all regional specific foods. But like, yeah, food is a great way to do it. It doesn't have to be rice. And if you're going back into the past, like, quite a ways back, rice has only been in Japan for about 2,500 years. And I know, like, archaeologists say only about. Only. But keep in mind that the record we have for the Jomon goes back to over 16,000 years. So yeah, relatively it's important, but it isn't the base of all of Japanese cuisine. And it's also not the base of cuisine for a massive time period within Japan. And yeah, not the only thing they're eating. <laughs> Think about like acorns and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> We could do a whole episode just on just on food. Maybe we should. Maybe we should. Yeah. Regional I, I, foods across. And that is a great thing, too. If you want to incorporate specific elements of Japan, you can look into regional cuisines and the history of it, because it's a fun way to learn some history about different places. And it's not all just, you know, samurai. <laughs> I, honestly, I think one of the most uh, a young me, one of the most interesting examples of how I learned something that blew my mind from food was, you know, when I was very young, I was like, you know, why are, why are these bun me? Why do they use baguettes? <gasps> and, you know, very young Daniel's like, I got to go find out. And then you <laughs> learn about like colonialism in Vietnam and how that affected yeah. their iconic cuisine. And that's a perfect example of, of how you can use food uh, as a vector for learning about history and culture. It goes so much deeper. I also where... ate a banh mi for lunch today. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm so I'm super happy. I'm <laughs> uh, But also, one, 
I love how you're like, oh, we should probably do one whole episode on food. No, like, no, we wouldn't do several. a thousand of them. Oh, yeah. In yeah. fact, there's a You've podcast out there, some. 100% My Kingdom for a podcast called Asians Eat, which is just about <laughs> eating <laughs> Asian food. Yo, Steve, are we going to do an Asians Eat? Because then, you know, like, we could, we, we got that double shot. Very true. It's very, very true. That, that'd be okay. Do you want Anyways. to? Do you, okay. Hmm. The the thing I wanted to mention was that the 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 way cultures like mix and mingle, yeah, colonialism and all that stuff where a lot of people got hurt. We can talk about that and be very respectful of like the things that we lost. But mm-hmm. that bun me and the idea of like uh, coming over to the United States and whatnot, there is now a fusion of like the traditional cooking methods of pho, uh, which also have roots in traditional French cooking. Uh, going over to the United States for gumbo, mixing mm. that, and there's a restaurant in Vietnam that has taken that and reimagined it using their <laughs> own Vietnamese ingredients back in Vietnam. And so you cannot possibly tell which is which anymore. All you know is that if the cook says they're Vietnamese, it's Vietnamese food, and if they're from like New Orleans, like it's New Orleans food. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you can't say anything about that. It's just beautiful and delicious which is probably the most important piece yeah and and i think that's like and i think that's where you know a lot of ttrpgs go do a really poor job of it it's like you know when people go into like a tavern like emma in in our game we i literally was like we're gonna start at a tavern i'm gonna give you that experience and i made a whole menu you made a menu i made a whole menu um (laughs) I'm like, maybe dishes I might not want to eat myself. But I was like, ah, these seem interesting. And I was like, I wanted to make sure this is a coastal town. There's going to be a lot of seafood and things that they could grow in this region. Like, the kitchen was also flexible because we had a vegetarian. Yeah, and, they, and the kitchen was flexible. <laughs> <laughs> and and our, our, um, our cleric was like, do you have vegetarian options? Because the watercress sounds really good, but I don't want the fish. And it, yeah, we had a whole thing about it. But, you know, like... <laughs> I think, you know, campaign settings and you know, actual plays and even like little zines would do players and GMs a great service in talking about the culinary traditions of, you know, this world. Um, I know that's something that I'm going to be talking about and the thing I'm working on, um, which is also like, like what you're doing, Emma, based on a very specific point in Chinese history, based in a very specific region in China. And it's going to be all about the, there's going to be a whole section just on the cuisine. Um, but Steve, I think we should do, well, I mean, we kind of do have a food show that's on the way. Um, we have a food show that we're it's kind of working on called uh, Bubble Tea Book Club. Um, and you know, this could be bubble tea and other things. Um, but we have a show that we're working on called bubble tea book club. Um, and we can make it happen. It is what we're, we're calling like a Patreon stretch goal. And I guess this is kind of a time when we can talk about Patreon. Um, one of the things that we did on Asians represent in during our break is not only did I play a lot of video games in my downtime, but we set up like a Patreon so that we can make Asians represent more sustainable. And that, you know, as our Patreon grows, so do our resources to allow us to produce more shows and feature more voices. Um, and one of the, our, our first Patreon stretch goal is called Bubble Tea Book Club. And once we hit, you know, 50 patrons, no matter how much they're paying, once we hit 50 patrons, we're going to add a monthly Bubble Tea Book Club. And Steve, perhaps Asians Eat can be one. And we could sit down and do an Asians eat thing. Um, Damn. And we could just, honestly, I think it would be really interesting if we could do something in person. And we just get like a whole bunch of food, a big wide angle lens, and sit down and eat. Um, could be real fun. Um, but yeah, I um, this has been like a really, this has been a conversation that I've been really looking forward to. Um, a, because I knew we were going to talk about like Japanese nationalism. I knew we were going to talk about how politics, um, you know, have an influence on what kind of knowledge is being disseminated. I knew we were going to talk about, you know, really cool things like the Jomon and like, uh, the Yayoi and the Kofun. Um, but I'm it's also, so hard cause it always feels like we always just get a little bit. It's so hard to cover these things in detail. <laughs> There's so much. And, and here's the thing about this: we can always 
go back to this. Now, you mentioned food as like, um, you know, Steve, you mentioned we could do a whole series just on food. Well, I've already been talking to somebody about doing a whole series on clothing and fashion um, for the podcast. And like, so um, I've been talking with um, a couple of South Asian folks about doing a particular episode on like clothing and representation. We're talking like Iza, uh, Evil Clever Dog is going to join us as well as Pooja who tweeted at us. Um, okay. But I think it would be really cool to do a whole series on this podcast about, you know, different kinds of clothing um, and how they're represented in TTRPG media. Uh, very much like how we talked about like, oh, the kimono and like the samurai, but also like I knew clothing is very, very different from, mm -hmm. you know, other kinds of traditional Japanese clothing that you might see. There's also uh, a renaissance in China of young people wearing hanfu. Um, yeah, the whole, yeah. As, as fashion statements that. or like LARP as like a really popular practice in, in China. Um, and I think this is something that we're going to explore. Um, but I know we're going to wrap up soon. Uh, Steve, yeah. did you have any last questions? Because we're wrap, I have a million questions. But because we're wrapping <laughs> up, what I wanted to share with the two of you and our audience here is that um, a lot of the conversations we've had, they were actually so in-depth and really interesting to me, but really hard for me to like build meaningful connections that I can take with me and put into my next game, things like that. But what I will share is that there was one thing that I really honed in on, and here's my my process, mm -hmm. and I've started a little bit here to just verify that's going to work. This whole like idea of like the keyhole, I literally keep uh, Googled keyhole, uh, giant keyhole Japan uh, into Google <laughs> because it's, it's, it's it'll like, work. <laughs> it, yeah, okay. <laughs> so it worked. It got me yeah. Kofun, and like it got me the Wikipedia page. It got me the Wikipedia page, and it got me all of, like this information. But Wikipedia, of course, is probably the most sterile, bland way you could possibly get information. Uh, I see a couple of videos as well, and I'm going to go into that. So my thought process here is that throughout this podcast, if there's one thing you're like, yeah, that's what I want to really research into, starting with one is probably the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Google it. Even if you can't spell it, just put the context in there. Giant keyhole Japan worked. <laughs> so can, I'm yeah. sure it'll work for you. We yeah. can put uh, the key terms in like a description as well yeah, well, because I'll, I'll that be... is, that's the best thing that i can offer is i can tell you so many details but you won't necessarily process it the best thing to do is to grab some keywords and start looking around mm -hmm. so and... giant keyhole japan like yeah <laughs> it works <laughs> uh you know you know what's a really funny way to find dogu Jomo Dogu is if you search ancient aliens Japan, oh, <laughs> you get no. Dogu, and it's ridiculous. It's I, ridiculous. It's I can't. trash. Um, oh. But what we're gonna do is I will definitely be putting a lot of our major like key search terms in uh, the video description on YouTube. Um, yeah. Kind of had a little bit of a goof, and the video didn't record for the first little bit, but we have audio for everything. And what I'll do is for the YouTube upload, I'll basically take the audio track and put it over like a graphic, and then we'll just upload it that way. Future episodes will just have all of our our, 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 our lovely, lovely faces um, on it. And Steve, your money maker, as you said. Your money maker, yeah. Your money maker. It makes said. me money. Like it, it makes you money, <laughs> right? Um, that said, we have some folks that we need to thank. Um, and that's our amazing patrons um one of the things that we want to do with asians represent is ensure that we can grow and be sustainable um one thing we don't want to happen is basically having me burn out again and decide that like asians represent can be no more um we don't want that to happen um and we also realize that in order to bring in more voices in order to you know increase the production value and share more resources we need your help. And so we set up a Patreon. Um, it's just patreon.com slash AZNS represent. Uh, we've got a couple different tiers um, and we have some incredible, incredible patrons to shout out. We have our disciples, but we have our guardians, Brooke Bright, Pixel Grotto, Daisy May, thank you for your support. And we have our 
most honorable patrons. And our most honorable patrons are, I was going to bring out Marla, but my my partner, who I've been texting to be like, get Marla, is uh, <laughs> not looking at her phone. Um, but we have our most honorable patrons who deserve a special, special shout out for their support of Asians Represent. And that's Ryan the Wizard Hall and sure Metal Weed <laughs> Games Andreas. And here's Marla. Marla is going to thank oh. all. Ow, class. Marla is going to thank all of you. Marla, say thank you to our amazing, most honorable patrons. No? <laughs> oh, did we get a squeak out of her? I think we got a squeak out of her, right? Marla? Oh, there we go. Oh, go. that's so small. Oh, oh. oh my oh, goodness. Bye, Marla. Um, every single time. <laughs> Every single time we stream, our most honorable patrons will get a lovely thank you squeak from Marla, the obese cat. Y'all are awesome. You are the most honorable of all of our patrons because that's the title that we wanted the tier to be. But again, seriously, thank you to everyone who supported us. Um, our show notes uh, from this episode with detailed links to articles and everything will be available for um, basically uh, select patron tiers. Uh, if you are a disciple patron or higher, uh, we'll have a an edited audio feed that's exclusively for you uh, on Patreon. Uh, if you aren't a patron or you don't have the means to support us, that is totally okay. Um, keep tuning in on Twitch, watch on YouTube, or even spread the word. Uh, everything helps. Uh, once we hit 50 patrons, we're going to start Bubble Tea Book Club. Fingers crossed we could do that this month. That's the goal. Uh, if we yeah. hit 150 patrons, we're going to do a Wuxia D&D miniseries. Uh, and I've already started assembling the cast. And I may or may not be playtesting it with my Sunday group. <laughs> um, but yeah, super, super hyped for all of our amazing patrons and your support. Um, and super hyped that Emma, you agreed to, you know, come on here and just talk, talk about us. Japanese past, talk like... about the Japanese past <laughs> and like the, the cool stuff. And also like, congratulations on completing your PhD. Like that was, Thank that is a you. huge undertaking. Not many people can finish that myself included. Um, so super, super proud of you. Super proud that, you know, we can call I could call you a friend and super proud that, you know, you've been able to take, you know, your academic experience and your lived experience and kind of sort of marry them with, you know, the gaming community that you've, that you've joined. Um, I know you always <laughs> that say that I like, pulled into. <laughs> whoa, 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 I, I asked you and you said, yeah, yes, I did. And then you just kind of stayed. <laughs> it's true. Um, once I got here. <laughs> yeah. Once you got here, you're like, ah, oh, dang, I guess I'm here. Um, but yeah, I, that does bring me around to one last thing I would like to say let's do it uh because I want this to be available to everyone we talked about the I do quite a bit yes and they are super cool but I would encourage everyone to learn about them but not necessarily incorporate them into your games and settings because they are a marginalized historically excluded and like they've been put down so much they really need to have their own voices out there before anyone starts or continues to tell their stories for them. So mm -hmm. learn as much as you can. That's great. But I'd say just maybe don't yeah. <laughs> do like use them because they've been used quite a bit already. I think a big takeaway from this is like, you know, the the Jomo and the Yayoi are like a really great there's, starting point. There's plenty to work with. <laughs> so much to work with. If you yeah. do want to learn more about, you know, the Ainu and folks who are kind of um, trying to reinvigorate Ainu traditions and renew understanding and interest in the Ainu, a really great place to start for me like, cause I, you know, I, I know about the Ainu from academia, but for me it was learning about Ainu Upopo. They're like everyday music. And there is a group yeah. called Mariru who do traditional Ainu music and they're on Spotify. Um, There's plenty of artists and they have their own resources. Read the stuff, watch the videos, look at the things. It's, I, I know super inspiring, but just be mindful of how they've been treated. And, you know, perhaps those stories need to be 
their own and not a, a TTRPG at this point. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a really good point to make. Uh, that that said, I know, Steve, we didn't talk about this or rehearse how we will end how, this podcast. How we actually end. <laughs> but the, normally what we do is like, you know, Zoom, it makes things really difficult to kind of sync things up. But at the end of every episode of Asians Represent, we tell you that, hey, look, you folks, if you have any questions about the themes, the topics, or anything discussed on Asians Represent, please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at AZNSrep. We have a shiny website that I that I made for us, AZNSrepresent.com. Um, check us out there. Check us out on Patreon where you can find exclusive content, show notes, uh, and more. Uh, help us decide what future topics we're going to cover on this show. Now, in two weeks, we're going to have our very own Jeremy Blum join us for Yay. a conversation of how key or chi in D D can be used more narratively rather than as a combat mechanic um really cool stuff but our patrons are really going to be able to help us shape the future of our content if you really like the fashion stuff let us know um if you have questions let us know we could pass them on to emma or you could reach out to emma via the, the social link below yeah. starchiologist doctor yeah. of starch Ooh, <laughs> yeah. doctor of starch um <laughs> <laughs> uh, reach out uh, but that said um, Steve we're going to do this we're going to do this I'm going to say my name is Daniel I'm Steve and you've just listened to Asians Represent Asians Represent oh god we'll, we'll work on this we'll work yeah. on this <laughs> you said it at completely different paces <laughs> yeah, it happens it, you, it happens you like didn't do it like we do in the podcast we do Asians like Asians Represent yeah okay we'll, we'll workshop this we'll, we'll figure it out but Take care, everyone, and we will see you next time.